The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Um, we've now heard about the really courageous decision to proceed with the Keck Observatory on, the, on behalf of uh, the foundation and, uh, um, and, and UC and Caltech. And now we're gonna get to hear about some of the exciting science that, that uh, uh, has come out of it. Our first speaker this afternoon uh, about the science is Mike Brown, the Rosenberg Professor of uh, Planetary Astronomy. Um, Mike, uh, this year, uh, uh, was a shared the Kavli Prize in astronomy, uh, in part for work that he did at the Keck Observatory. With that, Mike? So uh, the, the rest of the afternoon, you're gonna get a, a tour through the entire universe. Um, you're gonna hear about, about uh, galaxies far away. You're gonna hear about uh, planets around other stars. And I wanna start you out before we get there uh, and, and to start you out very close to home, somewhere that would feel very familiar if you could only um, perhaps uh, get your tongue on it. And so I'm gonna talk about the, the moon Europa, which is one of uh, Jupiter's large moons. It's something you can actually see if you go out with your binoculars tonight, maybe not tonight, uh, maybe in a couple of nights. <laughs> go out with your binoculars and look at Jupiter and you can see those Galilean satellites around there. And it's a, it's a strange thing, some people think to be studying something that you can actually just see with binoculars, but instead be studying it with uh, one of the biggest telescopes in the world. But I'll, I'll walk you through uh, the tremendous uh, advantages we have using the Keck telescope uh, for studying something like Europa and some of the really cool things that, uh, that we've been able to do there. All of this actually uh, just came out in a, in a paper yesterday, and so this is all uh, brand new and, uh, and pretty exciting stuff. So let me tell you a little bit about Europa first. Europa, as I said, is the, one of the, the moons of Jupiter, one of the large moons of Jupiter. It's the second one out. Io is the closest one in that you may have heard of. It has little volcanoes coming off of it. Europa, if you were to look around the solar system and ask yourself, what are the really cool places in the solar system? What are the interesting places? Where is something going on that I'd like to know about? You know, you might stick at Mars, because Mars has all these strange things. You might, you might go look at Titan, the, the moon of Saturn that has methane oceans of it, but you would, you would certainly stop and take a look at Europa. Europa has oceans underneath this icy crust, icy crust maybe 100 kilometers thick, ocean much thicker underneath there. If you take all of the water on Europa that's thought to be there, it looks like Europa has more water than the Earth does. Uh, so if you, if you looked at the solar system just through the lens of go find some water and see where there's something interesting, Europa might be your very first stop. And in fact, Europa was um, one of the earliest things um, explored in, in spacecraft uh, flying through the solar system, <coughs> the, the early pioneers and the voyagers, and then the Galileo spacecraft spent uh, most of a decade in orbit around Jupiter and studying things like uh, Europa, amongst other things. And there's a, an image of the Galileo spacecraft. It's actually not an image. This is a model you can buy and put together yourself. Um, and the, the nice thing about the model is that the antenna on the model actually works. This is the... Uh, the, the high gain antenna on the Galileo spacecraft, which if you remember back uh, 15, 20 years ago, that's the thing that never opened and it, it stayed stuck. And so, so uh, the Voyager, the, the Galileo spacecraft was stuck communicating back with this tiny little dish instead of this big dish. Uh, this big dish, by the way, is about uh, five meters across. So this entire thing could, could uh, sit inside the, uh, the Keck telescope dome. Um, one of the most important things that, uh, that Galileo found at Europa, besides making some of the fundamental discoveries about all the, all the water there, uh, was it started to look at the composition of the surface of Europa. And one of the reasons you might be interested in the composition of the surface of Europa is if, if you go back to this picture that I had here, you can imagine that if there's an ocean underneath uh, the icy crust of Europa, if there's an ocean there, and if, you, if there are interesting things happening in that ocean, and I'll, I'll leave you to imagine what those interesting things might be, but if there are interesting things happening in the ocean, if there's some way for the ocean water to get up to the surface, coat the surface of Europa, then you can just go to the surface, go to, go to Europa, look at that surface and see what's there and learn about what's going on in this 
some of the biggest oceans that we have in the solar system. And one of the things that Galileo found is that if you, if you look at Europa, this was actually known from the time of Voyager, but, but if you look at Europa, uh, there, are, there are two very different looking sides of Europa. Europa has a, a side of it that's very red. Um, you can see cracks all over the surface of Europa. And another side that's, that's uh, sort of yellowish, not, not very much red at all. And it's, it's interesting that that red side is, is the side that faces away from the direction of motion of Europa. So Europa goes around Jupiter, and just like our own moon, Europa always presents the same side to Jupiter. So it's fixed as it goes away around. And this trailing side, the, this hide that's behind the direction of motion, is the red side. That red side is the side that is getting bombarded. I'm going to have to keep going back to the same picture. It is getting bombarded at something like uh, 70 kilometers a second by this material coming off of the volcanoes of Io are all coming into that red side of Europa. This is going to be an important part of the story here in a minute. The stuff coming out of the volcanoes is uh, sulfur and oxygen. And as you can imagine, if you bombard an icy surface with sulfur, you're, you're bound to get some sort of red sulfurous, sulfurish materials on that one side. And that was one of the first things uh, that was noticed early on about, uh, about Europa. It was also noticed, though, that in addition to having ice, all this white stuff is, is as far as anybody ha has known for a long time, is, is nice, uh, relatively pure water ice. When Galileo got there and started looking not just at pictures like this, but looking at the spectrum of the surface of Europa, that means looking at sunlight reflected off of the surface of Europa and looking at taking that sunlight reflected off the surface, dispersing it through a prism and looking at the fingerprint uh, of the material that's there, it found that, that in addition to ice, the spectrum was showing something that was a lot like ice, but not quite ice. And a lot like ice, but not quite ice means that there were the absorptions in this spectrum that looked like water ice. They looked like there was water around there somewhere, but the water, something funny was happening to the water. And the funny thing that was happening to the water was, is that the water was absorbed into some sort of mineral. So when you looked at these minerals, that are, that, are, that are filled with water in them. You see the water, but the water is distorted a little bit. You can't really tell what the mineral is very well. And in particular, with the Galileo spacecraft, uh, it didn't have a very fine spectrograph. It couldn't really see in detail uh, what these minerals might be. So instead, um, people speculated and have been speculating for about 15 years what these materials might be. And one of the big speculations at first was that the stuff, the, the red stuff that you see, and maybe even some of this yellow stuff that you see here, are indeed um, salts. Salts that came from the interior of Europa, salts that coat the surface in some way. Pretty exciting, the idea then that you could just go to the surface and see what's really inside the ocean. It was realized a couple years later, though, that, that, that salts may actually not be the thing that makes the most sense, is that if you, if you take an icy surface like Europa has and you bombard it with sulfur, one of the things that you're going to create is sulfuric acid. And sulfuric acid absorbs water just like all these salts do. And sulfuric acid, if you look at it with the Galileo spectrograph, it looks like everything else. It looks like the salts that are, that are full of water. It looks a little bit like water itself. And so this, this whole region, this whole backside of, of Europa, looks like sulfuric acid. And sulfuric acid is, in a sense, inevitable. You're bombarding it with sulfur. You're going to have sulfuric acid. To many people, this was a little bit depressing because uh, if, if, you, if you want there to be some sort of connection between the ocean and the surface, if you want materials to come out so you can study them, if you want perhaps materials to maybe subduct into the ocean so that energy can come into the ocean, what you don't want is a big thick shell of ice and just sulfuric acid on the top because nothing can get through. So that was, that was considered by many uh, not very interesting, and therefore they were going to argue against it for a long time. So for about 15 years now, there have been arguments back and forth um, among scientists who really think it's salt, those who really think it's sulfuric acid. There's been sort of a, a peace treaty um, where, where people say, oh, this is all sulfuric acid, and this is all salt. Everybody gets their hemisphere of, of Europa. It's very, very nice about them. But the, the one thing that's been missing all this time is actual data that would tell you um, what, uh, what would happen. So. As I said before, the reason that you couldn't tell from, um, from Galileo is because the spectrometer on Galileo did not have very fine resolution. It didn't split the light apart enough to really see the details of the fingerprint. And one of the reasons why is because, of course, that spectrograph itself was really quite old. Uh, even by the time 
it got to, uh, to Jupiter, it was already probably 20 years old. Um, and so spacecraft instrumentation is always many, many years, almost decades behind the, the current state of the art. And also spacecraft, um, as I mentioned, that whole spacecraft could sit inside the Keck dome. You're really constrained on what you can put on a spacecraft. This is the very nice thing about having telescopes. Uh, the, the, the telescopes that, that we have on the ground have instruments coming all the time. Uh, they have instruments that are, are as big as a, uh, a small house sometimes. And uh, one of the very exciting things that you heard a little bit about um, that, that we could do now with the, uh, with the CAC telescope and adaptive optics is not just look at Europa as a big fuzzy blob like you would see in your binoculars, but actually look at it and, and make a map of its surface and take a spectrum at every point in that map of the surface and see what's really on that surface at much finer detail than, than the Galileo spacecraft did. It seems a little bit crazy, I have to say, that, that we could even come close to competing with a spacecraft that was flying right up next to, uh, to, to Europa. But as, as you'll see, the data that we're getting here, the spectral data, is so much better than what was uh, gotten from Galileo that we can really answer these questions right away. So first, how well can you really see Europa? The one thing we can't do is, you know, these, these are beautiful maps from, uh, from the Voyager spacecraft. You can see all the details here. We can't see that level of detail, but if you go to, uh, uh, here's just, just snapped with my phone camera while I was out there looking at Europa. There's half of Europa right there. And you can see that it it's, looks pretty big in, uh, on the spectrograph. Every one of these little points has a, has a spectrum of it in the uh, OSIRIS spectrograph and adaptive optics. There's one of the pixels that we were looking at. So we were, we were starting to construct this picture of what it looks like. And let me show you a disk to give you a feel of how good you can do. Here's Voyager again. And I want you to look at this shape here with like a little nose kind of sticking out right here, that kind of yellowish blob. That's the same yellowish blob right here. And that's about the extent of the resolution we can get. We can't, we can't see these cracks. We can't see uh, little lines across here. But for global mapping of what the composition of the surface of Europa is, you can really isolate these particular regions. And this wavelength that we have right here isolates regions that are not very water icy. So the bright things here, uh, the, the dark things here, it's kind of backwards from what you would think. The dark things are a lot of ice, a lot of ice, a lot of ice, and there's this big blob that doesn't have a lot of water ice on it. And so, uh, as with everything else, our goal is to try to figure out what's going there. So we watched Europa as it went around Europa. Uh, we watched Europa as it went around Jupiter. It takes about four days to go around. As you watch it over those four days, you get to see all four sides of it. And uh, we made a map of what we saw. So we, we have a full spectrum at every little point on the surface of Europa, which is just an incredible thing to have. But we can, we can first just say, okay, forget, forget the whole spectrum. Let's just try to make a basic map of where there's water ice and where there's not water ice. This will allow us to try to figure out what's going on. And um, here again is the Voyager picture. Here's that red side you can see. Here's that little thing with the nose that you saw a minute ago. Um, and the dark regions, here's our map from, from Keck and from the OSIRIS instrument, the dark regions are where there's not very much water ice, and blue is some but not very much, and yellow is very pure water ice. These, these polar regions up here are very pure water ice, not much water ice here, no water ice in these regions through here. Okay, so the main goal that we want to find out is what's this stuff that doesn't have very much water ice in it, so now we can actually look at the spectrum, don't just look at this map like this and see what's going on. Now I'm going to show you first what the spectrum of Europa, of these the same regions, looks like from the Galileo spacecraft. The Galileo spacecraft, um, this is the infrared region of, of, uh, of, of the uh, spectral region, just beyond what your eyes can see. Your eyes are somewhere down in here. Um, but in the infrared region, water ice in particular has nice deep absorption lines. And these, this, this is the amount of light reflected at each wavelength. A lot of light up here, it dips goes back up, it dips, it goes back up. These are, this is what water ice does, two microns, 1.5 microns. That's where water ice has its absorptions. And each one of these points is one of the points from the Galileo spacecraft. And it's pretty, pretty rough. What you would really like to do is fill in all these points in between and see what's going on. And in fact, that's what we did with the, uh, the Keck spectrograph. You can fill in all those points. And I just want to do that again because this, this is as good as it's been for 15 years. And this is uh, filling in all those points really, really well. Um, one thing you see is that the spectrum looks the same. That's actually um, gratifying. <laughs> it was, yeah, good. It was, you, you know, you're never sure it's going to when you actually do it, and it does. This, the, if you look at the same region of Europa, you get the same answer. That's actually good for, for everybody. Um, 
The next thing that you might notice is that there's, it, looks, it looks the same, and, and if you look in detail, there might not be very much extra going on. And this is where we, we didn't know what to expect. Were there going to be tremendous features that we hadn't seen before? Were there going to be anything? And the one thing that you see, this is going to be subtle, um, and it took us a long time of staring to make sure we wanted to believe it, but, but for the longest time, every spectrum of Europa was very flat across here. And if you'll notice, there's a little shoulder right there. Seems tiny, because it is tiny. Um, seems like you shouldn't bother writing home about it, but we did write home about it. And let me, let me tell you why. First, let me show you two in more detail. There's, there's the Galileo spectrum again. This is just that, that one little region where this dip is going to be. And let me show you that dip one more time. Um, it just flattens out right there and goes back up again. That answers one question instantaneously. And that question was, the first question is, is there something other than sulfuric acid on the surface? Sulfuric acid is absolutely flat across here. There is no way you can take sulfuric acid and make a little shoulder right there at 2.07 micron. So without even knowing what that thing is, we know that the surface is more than just sulfuric acid. Knowing that it's more than just sulfuric acid uh, is, is a hint that perhaps there's something really interesting going on. Let's see if we can figure out what that interesting thing is. The first thing we did is try to figure out where is that dip? Where on Europa do you see that little dip in the spectrum? Is it just that one spot that we had pointed out or is it somewhere more globally? And we looked and the answer is we're making a map again just like I did before. The dark regions are where the dip is. It's here, there's no dip over here. Maybe there's a little bit here but really it's not very much. Um, the dark regions, the, the, the dip, that one little dip is in the same place where Europa's red the same place where mostly the non-waterized stuff, the same place where sulfur is raining down on top of you at high velocity. It's a pretty good clue that that little dip has something to do with the sulfur raining down on top of you, which is in some ways not the answer we wanted. We wanted it to be sort of global and, and, and more interesting. But let's, let's now try to figure out what it is. The way you try to figure out what these things are, it's, it's actually a, a sort of tedious task. You, you go to a laboratory, you you concoct something that you think might be the right material, you take a spectrum of it in the laboratory, you do it over again, you do it over again, you clean your equipment, you do it over again, and uh, we, did, we did everything that, everything that anyone had ever proposed for the surface of Europa, and we did a lot of things that no one had ever proposed. Uh, my favorite is that we did, we did Drano. Um, turns out if you, if you freeze Drano and uh, put it in the spectrograph, grind it up, I'll show you a Drano. Drano is, um, Drano's right here. Drano turns out to just be um, sodium hydroxide. So there's Drano right there. Notice that all of these things in general, here, these are, these are they're, I'm sorry, they're a little faint. All of these are spectra of these, these materials, and they all look similar to that thing that I was showing. They have, they have dips, and they have dips, and they have little wiggles, and, and the only one that has the right little wiggle is this guy right here. Notice that little shoulder almost exactly like what you were looking at. I'm only showing a couple examples here. We did, I think, hundreds of things in the lab. Um, there really is nothing that we could find that makes any sense that has, has that shoulder there, except for this is the mineral Epsomite, Epsom salts. Um, it's amazing. There's no Drano, but there's Epsom salts instead. Um, Epsomite uh, is, is an interesting material on the surface of Europa because it's one that had been proposed um, uh, more than a decade ago. It was proposed because it was one of those things, one of those potential salts that people thought might be on the surface, but it was really the main reason people thought it was on the surface is because the spectrum looked sort of right. Nobody could see that little dip that would really confirm it. Um, but astronomers had thought for a long time that the oceans of Europa probably were full of sulfates. That's sort of a typical thing that you might get in, a, in an early uh, object like this. There, there are a lot of reasons they thought they were sulfates. People wanted that to be the answer, and so they proposed that this was it. Um, we really didn't think that this is what we were going to find. We didn't think that the that sulfates were the answer. This is one of the things we went out to disprove. Um, instead, we proved it. And you can see now, here's, that, that, uh, here's the spectrum again. Here's the best fit spectrum with no sulfates in it, just flat across here like this. And you add in that, that Epsomite right there, and it just fits uh, almost exactly right. It's a, it's a pretty clear indication that that's on the surface. There's one really strange thing though, because people had always talked about Epsomite being on the surface because it came from the interior. But if it's coming from the interior, why would it just be on the backside where it's raining down the sulfur? The, the, it's all of the Epsomite is here, 
the same region where all this uh, red material is, the general non-waterized material is. There's a lot of stuff over here that's also non-water icy. There's salt, we'll call it, over here that's not epsomite. And what is it? Well, we can look at the spectra of those regions. Um, this, this is the spectrum of the, of the leading side, much icier. This looks like a good water ice spectrum. You can try to model it with all sorts of sulfate materials. Uh, don't worry about what these are. Um, but they don't fit. And, and these, these things where they don't fit like this are subtle, but, but they matter. There's a, you know, a dip right here caused by this mineral. There's, there are dips over here, and they, they, they just don't fit. The sulfates, there are no sulfates on the, on the leading side of, of Europa. So that's a little bit strange. Uh, we have a story, and I'll, I'll leave you with the story that we have for what's going on, um, which, which flips a little bit of Europa on its head and makes for a much more interesting story than I think we had to begin with. Here's a story that, that, that we have proposed. Okay, so magnesium uh, sulfate is on the trailing side where it's being bombarded, and yet it's not anywhere else. Magnesium, there's no reason that magnesium should be on the surface of Europa unless it's coming from the inside. And so how can there possibly be magnesium uh, only on one side? The answer has to be, I think, that magnesium is everywhere. It's, it's probably not a coincidence that the thing you see on the trailing side of Europa is magnesium sulfate, and you're being bombarded with sulfur. Uh, so imagine instead that the magnesium is in a different form, it's bombarded with sulfur, and that magnesium, whatever it is, turns into magnesium sulfate on the trailing side, but on the leading side, the magnesium, whatever it is, is in its whatever it is form. Okay, so what is it? The, the, the uh, exact opposite sort of um, ideas of what you would have from the, in, in the ocean on Europa are that you would have a chloride ocean, that you would have magnesium chloride, and in fact, we have, we have found in the past copious amounts of uh, sodium and potassium, also from Keck observations many years ago, sodium and potassium in Europa's atmosphere. And so the, the assumption is that there's uh, potassium chloride, magnesium chloride, sodium chloride, that the oceans of Europa uh, are salt. And usually when I say salt, I mean salt with a grain of salt. Here I mean salt, like you would get out of your salt shaker at home. Um, and if you were to go taste that ocean, you were to go lick the surface right here, uh, you would have a very familiar taste if you could uh, rip your tongue back off from being frozen <laughs> to the surface there. So we have, other, we have observations we're going to try to do to, to confirm whether it's the sodium chloride, because that's a very exciting chemical possibility. Um, but, the, but at least as important, it's a, it's, a, it's a demonstration that the ocean is indeed in intimate contact with the surface. Material from the ocean is getting up. If you wanted to know what was inside the ocean, people have proposed these crazy ideas of, of, of drilling down into the ocean by like putting a nuclear pile right here and letting it, letting it go down through. Um, you don't need to do that. You could actually just go to the surface, uh, scoop some up and stick it into whatever your favorite machine is there and start to learn about whatever uh, materials and things and, uh, and what, whatever your favorite thing might be inside uh, a salty ocean um, that, that far away from the sun. So thank you. It's a, just a quick little uh, uh, view of what we have going on in the solar system. There's a lot more, but thanks for uh, listening.